Thanks for joining us today for our chat on heart healthy diet and exercise. We're very lucky today to have a staff member, exercise physiologist and program director of cardiac rehabilitation, Dr. Gordon Blackburn, and registered dietitian, Julia Zampano, to answer your questions about diet and exercise today. So thank you both for joining us. Thank you for having us. Um, if you would like to submit questions, those of you who are on with us, please just type them in the box that are below the viewer and we will try to get to as many as we can today. So we're going to start off with, there's a couple diet questions that um, we're going to go to first. And the first one is from Nancy Brown and she asks, besides the dirty dozen, what foods are important to eat organic? And Julia, maybe you can explain first what the dirty dozen is yes the dirty dozen is a list of foods that are put out every year that have been reviewed and screened to see how many pesticides and artificial ingredients they may contain so it's a list of the top 12 fruits and vegetables that are suggested to be purchased organic because they contain the largest amounts of pesticides and non-natural ingredients. And it is specific to fruits and vegetables, the Dirty Dozen list. Then there's another list that goes along with that that's called the Clean 15. So these are 15 fruits and vegetables that have been found to have the least artificial ingredients or added um, pesticides to the soil or sprayed on, on, on the outside of the fruit or vegetable. So that's something very worth looking up and making sure you gear your grocery list towards choosing organic based foods on the dirty dozen and non-organic choices on the clean 15. So in addition to those fruits and vegetables, the other foods that are suggested to purchase organic would be animal products because of the potential hormone injections or in inclusion of hormones in their treatment. Um, so I would consider meat and flesh meat being the number one meat-based and animal-based product to choose organic. Grass-fed meats are also highly encouraged. And then along with that, dairy products, so milk, and if possible, yogurt and cottage cheese and eggs. So first and foremost, flesh meat, so organic based and uh, free range and grass fed beef, as well as chicken, poultry, pork, veal and lamb. Then second, eggs and, and milk, organic, and then third, dairy products such as yogurt and cottage cheese and cheese. Thank you. The next question is from Susan and she asks about coconut oil, which you know we get a lot of questions about coconut oil. She said that she hears some people say that coconut oil is very healthy to consume. In the past they've even banned um, using it in popcorn and movie theaters. What is your reply to this question? And also, what would you say is the best and healthiest oil to use in a heart-healthy diet? So coconut oil has certainly gained a, gained a lot more press lately, more so due to some of the paleo style of eating. And coconut oil has been shown to have some positive health effects. But from a cardiovascular and heart health standpoint, it's not advised to be used regularly. It is a very high source of saturated fat. About 85% of the fat is saturated in coconut oil. So coconut oil has about 14 grams of total fat and 12 grams of that is saturated. So it's a very solid fat at room temperature and saturated fats have been shown to increase bad LDL levels of cholesterol. Therefore, we do not advise the use of saturated Saturated fats, including first and foremost coconut oil, but other saturated fats, including butter or lard or any solid fats at room temperature, such as sour cream or cream cheese, 
Palm oil is also a saturated fat, so trying to avoid the use of solid fats at room temperature from a cardiovascular standpoint. So the best oil to choose is an extra virgin olive oil, and that is based on the Mediterranean style of eating. Several studies have been shown to have been shown that olive oil and the Mediterranean style of eating is the best way to prevent heart disease as well as manage existing heart disease and risk factors. So extra virgin olive oil is the primary source of liquid oil to use. If you're looking for something in more of a solid form, I would suggest very moderate and small uses of actual butter or light butter, which is a butter blended with olive oil. Those would be the best choices. So you kind of answered this question, but I'll just to add to that, Michelle asks, I recently found out my t total cholesterol was 200, but my HDL is in the 70s. I cut out all the coconut oil I was using, thinking this was my main problem. Is coconut oil bad for you when cooking with it and at room temperature? Maybe you could talk about what is the serving size or how much oil or fat should somebody have even in a day if they're looking at keeping their cholesterol low? Sure. First of all, I want to expand off of her question. So she asked about um, a cooking oil. So something that's important to note is you don't want to cook olive oil in high heat. So there is specific types of olive oil that is safe for cooking at a higher heat level. So extra virgin olive oil should not be heated in a frying pan. It can be used in moderate heat, like baking or, you know, with something that's already hot. So let's say you steam vegetables, drizzling the oil on top of the steamed vegetables, but not necessarily cooking them in a frying pan with the extra virgin olive oil. So if you are going to use oil at a higher heat, we typically advise a safe olive oil and it will say that it's safe for cooking or high heat cooking, or a little bit more of a high heat stable oil, which is something along the lines of a sunflower, canola, or peanut oil. And that's typically would be advised for higher cooking, higher heat cooking. So um, Betsy, please, again, reinforce what your question was exactly in regards to so saturated fat. The so if you're cooking, yeah, the volume of oil. Okay. So studies have been shown that actually large amounts of oil and fat has been shown to be helpful to the heart. So uh, they're very calorically dense, so we want to be mindful of calories. Usually we advise between one to four tablespoons of oil a day. Now the range is quite large, but it really depends on the other calories that you're taking in your other source of calories, your other sources of fat. So if olive oil is your sole and primary source of added fat, then you can take up four, up to take four tablespoons safely. If you're doing other sources of fat, for instance, let's say you are using a little bit of peanut oil or some spreads or some nuts or peanut butter, then we want to go a little bit lower on the end of one to two tablespoons. So it all really Thank comes you. down to calories. Uh, when it comes to how much saturated fat are you allowed in a day from a cardi heart, cardiovascular perspective, we suggest anywhere between 5 to 7% of daily calories coming from saturated fat. So if you do want to use some coconut oil and you want to keep it within that 5 to 7% of your daily allotment for saturated fat, you still can use a moderate amount of coconut oil as long as you allot and uh, account for those saturated fat grains in your daily restriction. Thank so just to give you an idea of what that is, on a 1200 calorie diet, we usually restrict between seven to nine grams of saturated fat a day. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna bring Gordon um, onto the uh, back on camera. Welcome back, Gordon. And ask a couple um, exercise questions here. So 
Um, the first question is from um, about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I'm going to try and pull this on. So Sangeeta is a 57-year-old asymptomatic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient. Um, she's on Valsartan and Zolnodipine. She does yoga, and she wants to know if there are yoga poses she should avoid other than a headstand since she feels some discomfort in poses when the head is lower than the chest and also in holding poses for about 10 seconds. Um, so maybe you can talk about just in general even some of the different types of conditions like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where somebody may need some exercise guidance before exercising. All right, Betsy. So I, you know, I think there, there are several uh, points in, in this question. Uh, you know, Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, um, I'm not so sure that we're talking about a genetic uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy here. Uh, just reading into the question a little bit, uh, sounds like there's some blood pressure issues uh, and uh, there, it may be contributing to an enlargement uh, of the um, uh, myocardial mass. Um, and it's important to, to realize here that the heart is, uh, is a muscle uh, and if the blood pressure is running high, over time, uh, just like any muscle that does weightlifting, the uh, muscle can become enlarged, um, and that may be uh, what she's talking about uh, for the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, there's another hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that's genetically based, uh, which is very different, um, and I can talk about that a little bit more because I'd like to kind of focus in on the, the hypertension issues here. Um, she talks about the fact that uh, this is asymptomatic, and, and this is a critical issue. Uh, that when the blood pressure is running high, uh, for the most part, we are asymptomatic. We don't know what's going on uh, with the blood pressure. Uh, so it's important that that be uh, tracked and, and addressed appropriately. Uh, we're looking at, uh, at getting the blood pressure down, uh, definitely uh, the upper number in the blood pressure below 140 and the lower number in the blood pressure less than 90, although ideal numbers are uh, closer to the 120 over 80 range uh, for blood pressure control. Um, and the, the issue of the fact that this is asymptomatic is when the blood pressure is running high, um, it does damage to the arterial wall and to vascular beds, uh, and we don't know that that uh, damage is being done, uh, so it's important that the blood pressure be checked and the appropriate medications uh, be prescribed to control that along with lifestyle. <clears throat> now exercise is something that can be beneficial for uh, assisting uh, to control blood pressure and helping with weight because as the weight goes up, blood pressure also goes up. Uh, exercise, uh, aerobic exercise, uh, can bring the blood pressure down systolic, uh, somewhere around 9 to 14 millimeters uh, of mercury can be uh, uh, gain benefit uh, from doing aerobic exercise and maybe about 4 to 7 millimeters for the diastolic blood pressure. So aerobic exercise can be, can be very beneficial uh, as a, a tool to help manage uh, the blood pressure. Now, uh, the issue with the, uh, the poses, uh, you know, as the head goes down, uh, the blood pressure uh, tends to go up uh, in, in that vascular bed, uh, and it may be, not knowing what her blood pressure is, uh, if it's not ideally controlled, going into those uh, poses uh, may raise her blood pressure um, uh, in the cranial cavity, um, and that may be causing the uh, discomfort that she's feeling. Also, uh, with some of the poses that are being held for longer than 10 seconds, uh, if there's an isometric component uh, to the uh, muscle contraction while she's doing the poses, um, that will also drive up uh, both the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure uh, and can be uh, reaching uh, levels that are uh, significant and may be causing some symptoms. Uh, so I would encourage her to follow up with her physician, uh, make sure the blood pressure is well controlled on these medications not just at rest, uh, but also what the blood pressure response is with exercise. Uh, we know with uh, some of the studies looking at blood pressure in weightlifters, in bodybuilders and uh, extreme weightlifters, uh, we can see the systolic blood pressure get up into the range of uh, 300 even to 500 millimeters of mercury uh, for time periods, uh, which are exceedingly high and, and can be doing damage. I'd like to just come back for a second, if I can, to the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy because I think that might be a slightly different question. Um, uh, there's a genetic predisposition um, uh, that can lead to an enlarged heart. 
this is the primary uh, cause of death in, in athletes, uh, sudden cardiac death in athletes. Um, and uh, this is an issue that if it is a genetic uh, uh, and uh, an expressed uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, then we would be uh, excluding a lot of the higher intensity uh, aerobic type activities and certainly uh, the isometric weightlifting type activities would be restricted in that individual. Uh, but that usually affects, uh, or usually uh, expressed uh, in younger individuals, so at 57, um, less likely, but I certainly uh, would like more information and suggest that she follow up uh, with her cardiologist to get that information. So you mentioned weightlifting, and usually we do not do a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy chat without somebody asking about lifting weights. Um, are people with a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy totally restricted from weightlifting, or is there an amount that they can do safely? Yeah. That's an excellent question. I mean, certainly there is an amount that you can do safely. Uh, we don't know what that amount is. Um, because anything that if you pick up your briefcase, uh, you're doing some form of weightlifting. If you pick up uh, the garbage to take it out, it's a form of weightlifting. Um, but when we talk about competitive or uh, you know, doing weightlifting for a, uh, uh, a muscle mass gain, uh, we're looking, uh, we, we don't have good guidelines. Uh, right now, if you look at competitive uh, restrictions, um, weightlifting is excluded from a competitive standpoint. Um, if somebody does have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and is looking at doing recreational um, fitness uh, weightlifting, um, that's also discouraged. Uh, the issue is what's the blood pressure response uh, to these activities? And to be conservative, we're getting these guidelines not to do the activity, um, but there probably is a level where we can keep the mean arterial pressure, and that's a kind of a mathematical determination of what the uh, systolic blood pressure is and uh, the diastolic blood pressure, looking at what that mean arterial pressure is. Uh, and if that stays low, and usually as a rule of thumb, if you say it's not going any higher than what we're seeing with a moderate intensity aerobic activity, uh, we're probably not doing uh, significant damage by having the person exercise at that level. The hard part is very, very few people have their blood pressure assessed with aerobic exercise uh, and even very uh, uh, significantly reduced number have their blood pressure assessed while they're doing uh, isometric or isotonic activity, weightlifting. Are there other medical conditions that you can think about that also fall into that same um, grouping of people that really should be concerned before they start an exercise program or weightlifting as part of their exercise program? Yeah, uh, so good question. I think, uh, you know, there's certainly, there are several questions and it depends on the level of the uh, exercise and uh, um, if you're going to go in it uh, as a competitive sport, um, there are a whole set of guidelines that have been put out there uh, to help uh, guide the cardiologist, guide the physician. Um, and the individual as to what activities are appropriate. Uh, uh, any uh, cardiovascular genetic disorder, uh, valve disorders, um, uh, uncontrolled uh, blood pressure, coronary artery disease, uh, these are all things that need to be uh, evaluated uh, by the, the patient's physician um, uh, before they're even considering going into the activity. Um, and if they're in a very high competitive level, uh, they may be encouraged to reconsider uh, participating in that sport. Um, this next question by Michelle, I'll start with you and then I'll bring Julia on as well, because she asks um, what the best foods are to lower LDL cholesterol naturally, but she also asks, is exercise bad when I have been diagnosed with a bicuspid aortic valve with stenosis of 1 to 1.2? I don't want to wear out my valve if that's even possible. Um, so, uh, with aortic stenosis, it uh, is typically graded from a, a zero uh, to a four level, zero being uh, no stenosis and uh, four being a, a very critical uh, health threatening stenosis. Um, the, uh, uh, at uh, low levels of stenosis, uh, asymptomatic and low levels of stenosis, uh, there's no contraindications if the patient's not having any symptoms. Uh, for participating uh, in activity. Uh, once it gets to a moderate level, 
uh, of stenosis, um, then we're looking at uh, uh, reducing the intensity of the activity and avoiding uh, weightlifting type activities. Getting up to a severe or a symptomatic level where the person's having fatigue or shortness of breath doing the activity, um, uh, then we will put, uh, would recommend uh, certain restrictions and that should be uh, evaluated on an individual basis uh, with your cardiologist. Um, Julia, do you want to address the question about what are the best foods to lower LDL cholesterol naturally? Yes, absolutely. To lower LDL, it's the same along the lines as we discussed before as limiting saturated fat to as little as possible. So really reducing the amount of red meat and cheese and full fat or moderately fat dairy products and replacing some of those foods with fish, shellfish, or meatless meals. So increasing your intake of plant-based foods, which would, be, which would include beans, legumes, so dried beans, split peas, lentils, as well as whole grains. So trying to look at grains that may contain more protein as well, especially if you're going to reduce the amount of meat that you're eating, trying to replace some of the protein that you're not going to be taking in from the meat with beans, uh, legumes, peas, also grains such as barley or quinoa, brown rice, oats, those contain a little bit more protein. Maybe even looking at the type of bread that you choose or tortillas or wraps to compare for protein. And then of course increasing your intake of other plant-based foods such as fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds for more protein and healthy fats, avocados, and basically anything that grows from the ground. Um, since over this past year, the biggest news has been this whole idea of saturated fats. And for so long, we were told to restrict saturated fats. And now some of the articles have been saying, you know, just eat saturated fats. Um, so there's been a lot of confusion and discussion on the blog about that, about, you know, is there limitations on that? What does that mean? Um, should I totally change my diet? Can I eat whatever I want now? So if you could help people understand what that whole discussion means for them, that would be great. Absolutely. So I think the, the main key is that the discussion is not that we should eat saturated fats. So that's actually not the true assessment of what the change in recommendations has been. It's previously we have restricted dietary cholesterol. So dietary cholesterol is what had been restricted for several years and for a very long period of time because basically we took an association of if the food is high in dietary cholesterol, then it will produce high blood cholesterol. And what we found is that's no, not really the case. So it's that dietary cholesterol does not produce high blood cholesterol. But what does produce high blood LDL cholesterol or can contribute to high blood LDL cholesterol is high levels of saturated fat in the form of red meat, full fat cheese or cheese products, processed meats, uh, heavily sources of mayonnaise or sour cream, butter, lard, bacon fat, those types of foods that are high in saturated fat. So some of the restriction that has been released or what foods we're encouraging you to eat a little bit more freely are foods that are high in dietary cholesterol, but maybe not so high in saturated fat. So shellfish no longer has a strong restriction. So you can eat fish and shellfish, um, you know, within restriction of mercury, but no longer restricted in the form of dietary cholesterol. Eggs, now eggs are no longer highly restricted, where we in the past suggested no more than two to four egg yolks a week. Now we're suggesting that an egg a day is absolutely safe. And butter. Butter can also be used in moderation. It is actually by volume, a teaspoon of butter has less saturated fat than a teaspoon of coconut oil, as we addressed before, or a teaspoon of lard. 
So butter can be used in moderation as long as it's fit within your day of saturated fat allotment, depending on what your goals are. So if you have high cholesterol, keep your saturated fat to less than 5%, or if you have a history of coronary artery disease, heart disease. If you're just preventing high cholesterol, then you can go up to a little closer to 7% of your daily calories from saturated fat. Thank you. I'm going to bring Gordon back on as well. The next couple questions are related to exercise with different types of um, medical conditions that I hope um, you can address. Uh, the first one is from Robert, and he asks, if too much sitting can cause a heart attack, what are your suggestions for how much exercise that needs to be done during the workday to combat a sedentary job? Uh, so I think this is uh, referring to the fact that we're, we're seeing that individuals who uh, have uh, a, a large number of hours in a seated position uh, are at increased risk uh, of developing heart disease, uh, even if they have periods of exercise throughout the day. If they're spending several hours, eight hours uh, at a time sitting in a chair, their risk is higher uh, than the individual who has some activity during the day as well as a, a formal activity program. Uh, as far as the uh, amount of exercise, uh, uh, we can uh, so studies have been done that, that show um, we're looking to expend at least a thousand calories per week in exercise um, to get cardiovascular benefit. Uh, there's additional benefit as you move out toward 2,000 calories expended uh, per week, and if you're talking weight management, uh, going beyond the 2,000 calories is beneficial. Um, and if you're talking about high performance levels, these are individuals who are expending, uh, maybe may sig uh, expending significantly more than uh, 2,500 calories uh, per week in exercise. Uh, uh, now, when we talk about calories uh, expended per week, uh, the issue is most people don't know how to figure that out. Um, so we have nice guidelines uh, that have been provided uh, that we're looking for at least 30 minutes of exercise uh, five days per week um, at a moderate pace um, and uh, probably closer to an hour at a moderate pace five days a week. So uh, figure five hours of exercise per week at a moderate pace uh, would be a good rule of thumb. Uh, if you're going to go at, at, a, at a higher intensity, a more vigorous uh, pace, uh, you may be able to cut that back to about three hours of exercise per week. Uh, and when we say moderate, uh, moderate is a pace that you should be able to carry on a conversation. Uh, use that definition, moderate. It's, if I feel I'm pushing hard, uh, I can't talk while I'm out there exercising. Uh, I'm pushing it at too hard, hard of a pace. Uh, if it feels like I can do this all day long, um, then it's uh, too low of an intensity. Um, and, and the issue here is um, uh, you know, what's right for the individual. Uh, so somebody who's done no exercise, uh, and it's exercise, uh, no past history of exercise, uh, they're starting off at a lower intensity, so it's going to take them longer to burn that 1,000 or 2,000 calories per week. So they're the individual who may need to go the hour, may need to go a little bit beyond the hour, uh, versus the person who's been running uh, uh, or cycling or swimming uh, for years uh, and they uh, have a good functional capacity. They may be able to hit that 1,000 calories uh, within the 30 minutes of exercise to uh, maybe even a little bit less than 30 minutes of exercise uh, per session, five days per week. So moderate is very relative to the person. I think people want, a, you know, a number, you know, but it's, is there a way for people that are interested in um, a specific exercise program? How do you get that? Sure. Uh, so, so you're right, and this is the biggest problem we have with this, this term moderate. Uh, you know, it, it varies dramatically uh, from person to person. If you're really interested in finding out uh, what's moderate for you, uh, you can talk to your family physician, to your cardiologist, um, and uh, they may be willing to send you on for an exercise prescription and an exercise test to help set up the guidelines uh, for your specific activity program. Now, American College of Sports Medicine is recommending anybody who has not been involved in regular activity and is over age 45 certainly should be cleared by their physician, uh, and there may be benefit to conducting uh, an exercise test uh, in these individuals to set up the guidelines uh, appropriately. 
Um, so uh, we offer that here at the clinic um, uh, on a daily basis. Um, so we can set those activity guidelines up for you specifically. Uh, Stephen asks, he has um, paroxysmal VTAC and he's on Carvedilol, Lisinopril, and Rosuvastatin and Amiodarone. Um, he is stating about his PVT FEV dropping and he wants to know if that's a significant drop or if it's a testing variance. He's not short of breath and exercises 40 minutes, three miles per hour on a treadmill four times weekly very easily. Okay. Uh, so this is a good question. I think the, uh, the, uh, the prime concern here is related to the amiodarone, uh, which is uh, an iodine-based uh, uh, medication and uh, can uh, lead to deposits uh, in the lungs and have to be uh, monitored. Uh, the fact that the, uh, I think it was the FEV1 that he's talking about, the amount of air that he can breathe out in the first second uh, is about 82% uh, of his total uh, expired volume of air, uh, and that's within a normal range. Uh, so he's had two studies uh, six months apart uh, showing 82%, and this last one dropped uh, down to 77%. It's not a significant drop, uh, especially the fact that he's not noticing any shortness of breath um, and he's able to exercise on a regular basis without any discomfort. Um, I, I think that would be just a matter of continuing to follow that and certainly if he's having any more uh, issues of short, or he does develop any issues of shortness of breath, uh, then he should follow up with the physician. Um, you know, the medications that he's describing are uh, you know, seem to be appropriate uh, for managing uh, arrhythmia issues. Um, the, um, uh, you know, that's something that should be tailored to the individual and certainly following up with his cardiologist to tailor that uh, would be an appropriate strategy. Sometimes we get patients who are looking at, you know, who have pulmonary problems and then they also have heart problems. And they are not really sure if their exercise issues are related to lungs or heart. How do how do you test for that? So that that's an important issue. You don't separate out just the cardiac system, or you don't separate out just the pulmonary system, uh, nor the muscles. Uh, all three systems have to be working uh, well uh, to optimize performance. Uh, so one of the, the studies that we can do, uh, we do exercise tests, and we see how well the person does. Um, on that graded exercise test, we gradually ramp up the intensity of the exercise. Uh, typically, we'll just look at the EKG as an entry, uh, the electrocardiogram as an entry uh, exercise test to see if there are any problems with the, cardio, the cardiac system. If we're interested in finding out about the cardiovascular and pulmonary uh, systems working together, we can do a cardiopulmonary exercise test. Uh, and this is where the individual does exactly the same amount of exercise or the same exercise test. They walk on a uh, treadmill that every uh, one to three minutes is getting a little bit more challenging. Uh, or ride an exercise bicycle, uh, we're gradually getting more challenging for them to do the exercise. Uh, they exercise either with a mask or a mouthpiece in and then the nose clips on. Uh, we collect every breath uh, that the person exhales and analyze that for the amount of carbon dioxide, the amount of oxygen, the volume of air, how fast they're breathing. Um, and we can get a very good picture uh, as to how the lungs are functioning, uh, how the lungs are interacting with the cardiovascular system, uh, and how that is working uh, down to the muscular level, uh, and if the person is uh, having any difficulty in any of those areas. Um, I, Teresa asked a question which I don't know that we could answer, but she says open heart surgery in the past year, all bypasses have now closed at the branches and cannot be stented, are there any other options? Uh, uh, that's, uh, uh, you know, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, uh, the, uh, you know, if the bypasses have uh, closed down uh, and there's no option for stenting, uh, uh, it sounds like there may be some underlying collaterals. That would be certainly something to discuss with your cardiologist. Uh, collaterals, collaterals are small vessels um, that grow from one arterial system to the other uh, arterial system. Um, they very, tend to be very small uh, vascular bed um, that can keep the tissue viable. Um, 
Uh, we do see that uh, chronic exposure to the appropriate amount of exercise can be beneficial at stimulating the growth of the, uh, the collateral system. Uh, so I think uh, this is certainly an individual case that, that needs to be uh, discussed with a cardiologist, uh, um, but it doesn't uh, preclude exercise, uh, uh, but uh, would have to be done in a very uh, specific and uh, tailored fashion for this individual. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Julia, I'm going to get back to you. I have a couple questions here about carbs. Um, what are the difference between good carbs and get bad carbs? Is that still the case or should you limit all carbs? So there are good, bad, good Sorry. I typically do not advise. Sorry about, hey, Julia, I'm going to interrupt you. Could you start again? Because I lost you for a second off our screen. So if you could start answering that again. Sure. There are good, good carbs and bad carbs. Uh, what I consider a good carb would be a complex carbohydrate. So complex means it contains something more than just carb or starch. So it would provide you some fiber as well as some protein and extra vitamins and minerals. So examples of complex carbohydrates would include whole grains such as brown rice, barley, quinoa, farro, a whole grain pasta, whole grain bread, whole grain wraps, oats, um, whole grain cereals dried or cooked, whole grain shredded, um, shredded wheat or cream of wheat. So basically anything that has the first ingredient listed whole and that really doesn't have any other ingredients. So we want to avoid the ingredients of any added sugar, any added salt, any added fat. So really sticking to the grain alone. Um, the minimal amount of added ingredients in breads, um, so whole, more whole grains as opposed to adding any high fructose corn syrup or, or unneeded oils or sugars. So that would be what would be considered a complex carbohydrate in the in the form of a starch so also carbohydrates are found in other foods other than what we consider starches so carbs are also found in fruit also found in dairy products and beans or legumes so I would also consider some of those foods complex carbohydrates so beans and legumes certainly provide a large slew of healthy nutrients, vitamins, minerals, protein, and fiber. And that fruits also can give you a good, nice, natural sort, short source of sweetness, but fiber, pro, uh, no proteins are fiber, um, vitamins, minerals, and can be in the form of a complex carbohydrate. So for instance, a pear and apple have up to four grams of dietary fiber. And soluble fiber specifically has been proven to help lower cholesterol levels. So soluble fiber is that gooey, gummy fiber that's water soluble, and it binds around something called bile in our guts, and bile is composed of cholesterol. So once it binds around the bile, it helps remove the bile with the body's waste, therefore leading to lower blood cholesterol levels. So soluble fiber is found in oats and barley, brown rice, pears, apples, uh, bananas, some citrus fruits, some legumes, flaxseed. So certainly um, you would be doing yourself a disservice by avoiding some of those foods. Bad carbohydrates are what we call simple carbs. So there's really very little amount of added benefit besides just starch or what we convert into sugar, glucose, fructose. So those would be things like white bread, white pasta, white rice, fruit juice, fruit snacks, dried fruit with fruit sugar added, um, yogurt with fruit on the bottom, syrupy yogurt. So, you know, of course, cookies and cakes and pastries, baked goods, candies, um, anything really that's quite ev evident that the first ingredient is sugar or a, a variety of the ingredients that can include what we call a simple sugar. Um, there's a comment on the um, on the blog about Dr. Esselstyn's diet. Can you um, 
describe the differences between there's the Mediterranean diet and the very low fat diets and, the, um, and then there's TLC diet and that, there's all these different types of diets. What do you recommend generally and then how do you counsel patients about the best diet for them specifically? So Dr. Esselstein is um, a specific physician that refers uh, refers his patients to follow what we consider a plant-based diet. So he also encourages very low in fat. So even plant-based fat. So plant-based diet means that you abstain from all animal products. So that includes meat, cheese, eggs, dairy, or anything that comes from an animal. So in some higher extreme cases, don't have honey or anything that's associated with an animal. So that's what we also can consider more of a vegan diet, but we've really encouraged the term plant-based because we're encouraging that you're eating a majority of plant-based foods. So Dr. Esselstyn's diet specifically does further restrict fats that even come from plants. Of course, abstains from any animal fat, but oils and nuts and seeds are also e either restricted by quantity and how much you can have or avoid it completely. So that's Dr. Esselstyn's diet. That um, plays a role in certain preventive, um, cardiovascular preventive patients. So certainly if that's a diet that you're interested in following, I would advise meeting with a dietitian to get the proper nutrients and nutrition from the foods that you choose, which is very possible, but sometimes may need a little bit of guidance and suggestions in making sure you're meeting your vitamin, nutrient, and protein needs. So as to the Mediterranean diet, that is the diet we tend to suggest. It is more whole foods based. So what that means is that li limiting and significantly decreasing processed foods. So anything in a box bag or can, with several ingredients. Usually encourage choosing foods that have between three to five ingredients and choosing more whole-based foods. So what that means is fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, grains that you purchase, fresh grains, as opposed to them being in a box with a powder or a sauce or already prepared in a can. So that is more of a Mediterranean style of eating. Mediterranean diet also encourages eating more fish and very little red meat, white meat as opposed to dark meat and poultry as opposed to other sources of red meat besides just beef but limiting pork, veal, and lamb. And having meatless meals, so including beans and legumes regularly into the diet and if possible using beans and legumes as your source of protein to replace animal protein. So dairy and eggs are in moderation. Like I said, safely can have an egg a day, and dairy is pretty much limited to using more so um, skim or low-fat milk or yogurt, and limited amounts of cheese or processed cheese specifically. So encouraging natural cheeses, again, to so something like a part skim mozzarella, a fresh ricotta, a feta, a Swiss, as opposed to vel uh, something like a... a uh, cheese product, like American cheese slices or the cheese product blocks or the liquid cheeses. Okay, we're turning back to exercise again. Um, Stephen asks, he says, me again, thank you by the way, some cardiologists say 10,000 steps per day. I, I subscribe to your recommendation of 30 minutes five times a week. 10,000 steps is five miles. I don't know anyone who does this. Your thoughts, please. Uh, so, uh, so it's interesting. Uh, there is a, a large uh, contingency out there that would recommend uh, uh, using pedometers or measuring steps uh, to get to the 10,000 steps per day. And you're right, that is about five miles per day. Um, uh, not that uncommon that people are running uh, five miles uh, on a daily basis, if not uh, 10 miles and more uh, on a daily basis. So it's not uh, unheard of that individuals are going to get up to that level. Uh, but again, we're trying to come up with strategies that uh, are easy to uh, understand and get the message out. Um, the 10,000 steps uh, focus in on overall activity, 
rather than the intensity of the activity. So it's the total of 10,000 steps in a day. Uh, that includes uh, you know, walking from the car to the office, uh, walking up and down a flight of stairs, um, just walking around your house doing chores. Uh, it doesn't address intensity at all. Uh, so we're looking at the total volume in 24 hours to get to that five miles or 10,000 steps. Um, and, and that's great for calorie expenditure. Uh, the more steps we take, uh, the more calories we're going to burn. And certainly in, in North America and, and now uh, becoming a greater problem throughout the whole world, um, weight management or obesity uh, is, is becoming a critical health uh, problem. And uh, the more activity we can expand, combining that with an appropriate diet uh, is going to help control weight. Um, but beyond just the base level of activity, it's important to focus in on the uh, intensity. And what I was addressing before in the uh, 30 minutes, that's 30 minutes at a moderate pace. So it's not a casual walk. Uh, it's got to be brought up to about 50 to 60 percent of the individual's intensity. Uh, and when we talk about a more vigorous uh, pace, uh, we're talking about uh, 70, uh, maybe even up to 80 percent of the individual's capacity at, at those higher intensities so we can shorten up the time a little bit. Uh, so any activity burns up calories. Uh, if you want additional benefit from a cardiovascular standpoint, uh, the intensity definitely needs to be factored in there as well. When you mention pedometers, um, are there any types of technology or different things that you have found that helps motivate your patients? And when um, are heart rate monitors something that a patient should consider? Uh, so certainly, uh, pedometers are little devices that you can wear uh, on your belt. Uh, some of them you can put in your pocket, uh, uh, carry them around with you, and they just give you the uh, count of how many steps that you've taken. Uh, we've seen uh, these have advanced now. Uh, they're wrist versions. Um, uh, I don't know if we're allowed to say products uh, here or not, um, but uh, there are manufacturers out there that uh, uh, you can put these devices on your wrist and, and get uh, heart rate as well as uh, the number of steps and, and the intensity, how quickly you're walking, uh, and we can break it down into uh, more vigorous steps and, and, and casual steps and give you a count uh, throughout the day as to, to uh, how many are in each category or each registry. Um, the, uh, uh, the pedometers don't give any indication of in intensity uh, at the base level. Um, heart rate is the, the, uh, uh, the one it, um, measurement that we can look at uh, that will give us a little bit more uh, specificity regarding the intensity of the activity. Uh, you can look at the wrist versions. Uh, some of the data that's coming out, and we're actually we're conducting some research right at this point in time looking at these wrist versions uh, versus, versus the uh, chest strap heart rate monitors. Uh, we find that uh, at rest, the uh, wrist versions do a, a pretty good job of capturing heart rate, uh, but during activity, uh, whether it's either the movement of the wristband uh, or, or just the algorithms uh, themselves, we're not clear on that at this point, um, may not be all that accurate or as accurate as we might like them to be. Uh, the chest strap versions uh, certainly have more data on them and what we've seen uh, are more accurate at recording uh, heart rate. So if you know what the heart rate is that you should be aiming for, um, then we would encourage the, the chest strap version over the wrist strap, but uh, they're, they're both good. As far as, as tools that are out there, uh, there are apps all over the place um, that can help you with your diet, can help you with your uh, exercise program, figuring out how much activity you're doing, tracking that, uh, merging the, the fitness and the exercise or the uh, nutritional information together uh, as far as calories coming in and calories going out uh, to help you with that. The interesting part is uh, when we look at these apps, uh, they're relatively short-lived. Uh, someone will get uh, very uh, compliant with recording things for about a three-month time period, uh, but then the use of these apps drop off. Uh, hopefully in that three-month time period, somebody would be able to establish a lifestyle pattern that would be beneficial and you may not need all that uh, documentation. Uh, but when we talk about lifestyle change, uh, it's usually closer to a six-month time period of doing something on a regular basis uh, before it uh, becomes ingrained in our lifestyle. Um, I have to ask this question somebody sent us in about um, atrial fibrillation. They are a marathon runner and they have atrial fibrillation 
and they're going to get a catheter ablation to control the AFib, and they want to know if they will be able to go back to marathon running at some point in time. Uh, so, so this is interesting. Uh, there's a uh, over the last five years, we've seen several papers coming out talking about the fact that uh, individuals who stay in high-intensity competitive athletics, so this marathon runner, um, cross-country skiers is uh, is another population uh, from Scandinavia, a very large, uh, uh, great study looking at the development of atrial fibrillation in this population. And it is much higher in the population uh, who pushes at the high intensity for, uh, for several years. Um, now, having said that, uh, atrial fibrillation in and of itself uh, doesn't exclude you from doing uh, uh, vigorous activity. Uh, depending on the conduction rate, uh, you may be able to run a marathon in, in atrial fibrillation. Uh, if the rate is not well controlled, uh, and the rate's getting very high, that is going to uh, have a negative impact on, on the efficiency of the heart function uh, and getting that rate under control or eliminating the uh, atrial fibrillation uh, would be beneficial. Um, we have a sports cardiology section here at the Cleveland Clinic uh, and these are the types of issues that we deal with on a regular basis. Um, somebody with atrial fibrillation considering an, an ablation uh, and their concern about getting back to the sport that they love or the activity that they love. Uh, it is very possible uh, that after the ablation uh, that you will uh, have uh, no more atrial fibrillation if it's successful and I hope that it would be, uh, that you could get back to the uh, activity. Um, the, uh, the atrial fibrillation continues, uh, then we would focus in on uh, rate control and if we can get good rate control, uh, you may be able to continue on uh, with activity as well. Um, we'd also say in a worst case scenario, um, uh, if a pacemaker uh, was needed uh, as a backup after the ablation, uh, it's also uh, very doable to go out and do the exercise with a pacemaker in place when it's appropriately programmed for your activity. Thank you. Um, Julia, there's a question about flax and chia, and I guess I want to know, first of all, there's so many of these things that people say you should definitely include in your diet. Are, the, are there really things like flax and chia that you definitely should include in your diet? And if you are going to include them, is, are there things that they should know about those types of products? What are the best types to choose? Yeah, so Flax seeds and chia seeds are both seeds, and they do have a good, very good source of omega-3 fatty acids in the form of alpha-linolenic acid. So something to keep in mind with omega-3 fatty acids is they can lead to some blood thinning. So if you are on blood thinners um, or you tend to have easily nosebleeds, or tend to bleed very easily, you want to be cautious on how much of these you're using. That being said, most of the time if you're taking it in through your diet, it doesn't create an issue. But if you are taking it in a capsule or liquid form, that's when the issue typically can arise. Uh, flax seeds and chia seeds are very good sources of fiber and protein. So generally, most people cannot tolerate more than two to three tablespoons a day because it is a, a good, decent source of fat and fiber and can cause some gastrointestinal distress if taken in high amounts. So your body will naturally adjust the amount you need that's safe for you to have from the pure food form. So I usually do suggest in the form of dietary sources, so eating the ground or milled flax seeds, so adding it into your food, so for instance, sprinkling it on top of a salad, putting it in an oatmeal or a yogurt and a smoothie, or the chia seeds, same. Um, the flax seeds do need to be ground or milled in order for you to digest the omega-3 fatty acid in the form of alpha-linolenic acid. The chia seeds do not need to be ground or milled and can be taken in their whole form. So if you are going to supplement with chia or flax seeds, I think it's very safe to do at anywhere between one to two tablespoons a day. Just being mindful if you are taking a blood thinner or Coumadin, just indicating to your physician that you are going to begin a dietary supplementation. 
Uh, I would advise more caution when you're taking it, again, like I said, in the liquid form of black seed oil or, of course, the capsule form. I think the dietary sources reap benefits over uh, a liquid or a capsule form because you are gaining fiber as well as protein from these foods, so they will help you um, with regularity and gastrointestinal health as well as helps again like I said that soluble fiber will pull some of that bile which is composed of cholesterol from the bloodstream has been shown to help with blood pressure triglyceride values have been proven to be reduced by intake of omega-3 fatty acids and fibers so I think the dietary sources is the most beneficial um, for both of you, as we end this chat in the next um, few minutes, Julia, do you want to start with what is your biggest thing, your biggest advice, the best advice? If you have a patient that comes into your office, what do you want them leaving knowing um, from your consultation? So I think that's a great question, but I think there's not one thing that comes to mind. I think it's very specific to the patient. So every patient that leaves my office, I typically try to leave them with a, a different message depending on what their need may be. So we just have to remember that everyone's individual, so there's not one diet that's the best for everyone, and I think that's where everyone gets caught up into some of the recommendations. And there are so many diets out there, which is the best? Well, I think the best diet for you is the one that you will be able to follow long term. So if someone, completely dislikes meat and we put them on a high protein diet, they're most likely not going to have success. If someone dislikes beans and vegetables and fruits and we put them on a vegan diet, most likely they will be unsuccessful in that diet. So I think it's very important to look at each person individually, what their eating habits are, what their diet likes and dislikes are, and then what their medical health and nutritional goals may be. So I do a pretty thorough assessment of all those things with my first visit with a patient. And then I create a plan based on what their needs are, what their likes are, and um, what their nutritional history and status might be. So I, I don't really have one answer for that question. My, my answer with that to that question would be go and meet with a dietitian and get a full nutritional assessment and meet with an expert that really can guide you in the direct correct direction as opposed to reading a lot of misinformation that we have at our fingertips now on the internet and it's also hard when we read studies and we may read the first line of the study but may not read the body or the content of the study so it may say Coconut oil causes cancer, and we may not have seen that the study was done in rats or the certain population that the study was done in, or, you know, eggs are bad for you, or eggs are good for you. So it's important to read the body and the content of the, the literature that you're reading and read wisely. So stick to research medical articles and papers and websites that have .gov after them, because those are all governmental web-based websites, so most of, or all of the information there would be research-based. Or, of course, our website. <laughs> um, and, uh, Gordon, would you like to also talk about, as an ending point, just about exercise and what people should take away from this if they want to start an exercise program and the benefits of exercise? You know, I, I just like to build on what Julia said. Uh, there's no one program that's the best for everybody. Uh, it needs to be tailored to the individual. Uh, but across the board, the one thing that we have seen that uh, if somebody is not doing activity uh, and there's not a contraindication to activity, uh, getting more active in your lifestyle is, is beneficial. And we try and find out where everybody's starting from, what their goals are, and help them design uh, their program that's going to help them meet their goals. And so what would be the benefit of what happens when you go to a preventive cardiology program like what you have or, or cardiac rehabilitation? What, what does that involve? Sure. 
So, so we're seeing, uh, you know, you brought up the, the preventive cardiology program where we see individuals that are typically at risk for developing heart disease, uh, the cardiac rehab program for individuals who already have documented heart disease, uh, and we also have the sports cardiology program for the elite athlete who has heart conditions. We're seeing individuals at, at across the whole spectrum uh, and designing programs for them. Uh, so it, it's really critical uh, uh, to come in and have that program uh, designed for you. Uh, and that's what we do in, in the preventive cardiology, the cardiac rehab, and the sports cardiology program. Thank you, and thank you both for answering all these questions. There's a lot of great information here, and I want to thank all of the people that watched and participated for joining us today. Thank you, Betsy. Yeah.